Hello. Thank you for the invitation to this conference. Today I'm going to talk about the perception of Constantinople in heavy metal. Byzantine in English can mean devious, intricate or labyrinthine. In contrast, museum exhibitions play with Byzantium's religious aura by using titles such as The Glory of Byzantium or Byzantium Light from the East often advertising with golden icons as a metaphor, continuing a narrative of a Christian beacon in the East. In metal, there are comparatively few encounters with the Byzantine Empire. Although Jeremy Swift has counted over 100 bands in his 2021 essay with the title Headbanging to Byzantium. Some songs use the image of Byzantium or Constantinople as a past pro toto to reconstruct a glorious Greek past. Other songs deal with well-known Byzantine protagonists, such as Emperor Justinian and slandered wife Theodora. The interest of songwriters often lies in male military rulers with expansion plans, or scandalous women appealing to metal's taste for heroes, legends, warfare and transgression. Other songs on Constantinople paint the image of a golden and exotic focal point of foreigners' imaginations and desires. In this paper, we look at music dealing with Byzantium's capital, Constantinople, today Istanbul. With my background in Byzantine art history and archaeology, my questions revolve around Constantinople's reception in metal lyrics, cover art and stage performance. How does metal navigate the dynamic field between historical accuracy, Byzantium's reputation and artistic license? A few words on Constantinople. It was the capital of the Byzantine Empire, built over the antique city of Byzantion. In 330, it was renamed after the Roman Emperor Constantine the Great who subsequently invested substantially in its redevelopment. The geographic and strategic situation was ideal to uh, control the Bosporus, which connects the Black Sea and the Mediterranean. The peninsula is surrounded by the Sea of Marmara in the south and the Golden Horn in the north, an estuary feeding into the Bosporus with many of Constantinople's sheltered harbours. Constantinople soon developed into the second Rome and became a vibrant and densely populated metropolis, a political, economic and artistic centre, which continued Roman institutions and traditions after the fall of the Western Roman Empire in 476. The Byzantines called themselves Romans, Romei, but Roman traditions were slowly adapted and in the 7th century, Greek instead of uh, Latin became the official language. Emperor Constantine had strongly supported Christianity, but it was only until 380 that Christianity became the official state religion. Today, some architectural remains are still visible, such as the aqueduct of Valens, the 6th century church of St. Sophia, and remains of the circus, the Hippodrome, next to the almost entirely destroyed Great Palace. Since the 5th century, the city was protected by the walls of Theodosius, which were only breached on two occasions. First, in 1204, during the Fourth Crusade, and I refer you here to Judicator's song, Queen of All Cities. And second, in 1453, when Constantinople was taken by the Ottomans. A complex picture of Constantinople is painted by three bands who approached the Byzantine Empire and its capital from a Viking perspective. The Varangian Way and the Stand Up and Fight by Drusas, The Last Viking by Leaf's Eyes and Miklagard by Rebellion. Lyrics, album and stage design are a feast for the Byzantinists. As an example, here's the stage design for Tourisas from 2015, based on Byzantine triptychs, religious Im images with three parts, 
with Byzantine Byzantine, Byzantine style iconography. Each album discussed here lays a focus on different events, protagonists and historical details. The common denominator is the 11th century journey of the Eastern Vikings, the Varangians, to Constantinople, known as Miklagard, the Great Stronghold. They travelled from Scandinavia via the Gulf of Finland, along the Russian rivers past Lagoda and Kiev, the Dnieper Rapids into the Black Sea and through the Black Sea into the Bosporus. Much critical assessment of primary and secondary sources from Byzantium and the Nordic sagas has been woven into the stories and Leif's eyes especially comes with a strong background in reenactment. The Varangians enter historical records in 839 in connection with the meeting of the Byzantine Emperor Theophilos with Emperor Louis the Pious in the West. He was the son of Charlemagne and this meeting took place in Ingelheim near Mainz in Germany. The Varangians, the Varangians appear again in 860 when they attack Constantinople, quote, like a thunderbolt from heaven, according to Patriarch Photius. Despite recurrent raids, a trade route was established between Scandinavia and Constantinople in the course of the 9th and 10th centuries that is mentioned in the Nestor Chronicle as the way of the Varangians to the Greeks. The albums discussed here are set in the first half of the 11th century during the route's heyday. In Rebellion's Miklogard album and Turissa's Varangian Way, the focus is on the perilous journey which culminates in the arrival at Miklogard shimmering golden on the horizon on Rebellion's album. The last song on Turisa's Varangian Way is the epic Miklogard Overture. The Varangians arrive in awe of the marvels of Constantinople, the dream come true for the decimated crew. They see the golden roofs of palaces and churches glittering in the sunlight, a bit like on Rebellion's album. Quote, Queen of the cities, veiled in mystery, the sublime, the greatest of our time, Zagrad, referring to the Slavic name of Constantinople. The German power metal band uh, Rebellion song, Miklogard, is similar in praise. Quote, Mighty walls of shining grace, the golden roofs of Miklogard, palaces of gold and stone. The cover art of Stand Up and Fight shows the famous Church of Saint Sophia in the background as a metaphor for the city and the riches within. However, in the front is not the humble applicant for a job in the Varangian Guard, but a warrior with a blood-covered sword, like the Patriarch's thunderbolt in full attack, not the trader. Rebellion, on the other hand, places a larger emphasis on the importance of trade for the Vikings, thus constructing an alternative narrative that encounters notions of the constantly fighting warrior Vikings and thus reflecting trends in academic research. Rebellion has then brings swords from Dorestad and amber from Haithabu, Hedeby, to trade for silken cloth, spices, glass and jewellery on eastern markets. Trading was an important Viking occupation, while heavy metal so often paints a stereotypical image of an invincible uh, Viking warrior. The Varangians often enrolled in the legendary elite bodyguard of the Byzantine Emperor, the Varangian Guard, that inspired research and metal songs alike. This 12th century miniature in the Skelitzes manuscript is one of the rare depictions and it pops up whenever you search the term Varangian on the internet. Mostly comprised of Varangians and Anglo-Saxons, the Varangian guard was immortalized by the Byzantine princess and writer Anna Komnene as tall and axe-bearing, loyal and bold warriors. There seems to be an accurate accuracy of fit in modern and 11th century views for once. 
Tourisos in the March of the Varangian Guard refers to Anacomenes' description, quote, the ex-bearing fighters, the avidly namers, end quote. Amon Amath's Barriacs of Miklagard hardly deviate from this image. The lyrics mention the keywords loyalty, oaths kept to the death, and axes, spears, and swords. But in the song, they return home after 20 years or more of imperial service, probably taking home riches, but sounding very burned out. Tourists go into detail on the Varangians in Constantinople and describe also a race in the Hippodrome with a Greek title Venetoi Prasinoi, referring to the racing team's colours blue and green. A day at the races was, until 1204, part of city life in Constantinople, as in Rome, that surely included gambling. We can see a marble gambling machine in Berlin today, and that was found in the Hippodrome area, here in the middle, and it surely included heavy drinking. The Nestor Chronicle warned the Byzantine Emperor not to let the Varangians in because they were up to no good. Now a content warning. The Varangians' dark side is not the Viking narrative in heavy metal, where the heroic, loyal and adventurous side prevails as drafted by Anna Comnena. Belligerent is what the above-mentioned patriarch Photius called them. But he would, be, he would have been slightly biased after that thunderbolt attack on Constantinople in 860. Scribing graffiti in the Hagia Sophia, as you can see uh, in the top picture, was surely one of the more harmless things they did. But there was also despicable crime. Another image from the Skelitzes manuscript presents a woman who was killed who was killed of a Varangian who had tried to, rape, tried to rape her. On the right, his fellow Varangians present the woman with his clothes in an attempt to atone for his crime. Content warning over. The story of Harald Hadrada, a.k.a. the last Viking, is an important backdrop. Harald, the hard ruler, was the half-brother of St. Olaf and became king of Norway after his Mediterranean adventures. He was a member of the Varangian Guard and even erroneously called King of the Varangians in a Greek source. His positive and heroic image was shaped through later Nordic sagas, but he was surely not a benign character and, according to some sources, had personally gouged out the eyes of the Byzantine Emperor. Harold's itinerary as a mercenary in the Byzantine army calls for Hollywood. Hunting pirates in the Aegean, expeditions to Sicily and Bulgaria, leading to the charming nickname Bulga, Bulgara Brenia, Burner of the Bulgars, further to the Saracens, Palestine, Jerusalem, Syria, Mesopotamia. Heavy metal has tapped the story's potential. In Turissa's Varangian way, Harald appears in the song 501, referring to the number of men accompanying him to Constantinople. In the song The Great Escape, Turissa's described the daredevil story of uh, the daredevil story of Harald's escape from Constantinople by boat through the Golden Horn. This was closed with a huge chain a significant part of the city's defence system. You can see it in red on the map at the top. It might have inspired Tyrion Lannister's chain in the Battle of the Blackwater in Game of Thrones, talking about which the fire avalanche in that battle seems also to be based on Byzantium, namely its magical weapon, the Greek fire, that inspired songs again by Tourisas and also Bible of the Devil. The Iceland song Heimskringla, supposedly by Snorri Sturluson, describes Harald's ingenious way to overcome the chain. Quote, when they got to where iron chains were lying across the channel, then Harald said that the men were to sit at the oars in, on each galley, while the men that were not rowing were all to run to the rear of the galley. 
So the galleys ran up onto the chains. As soon as they stuck and lost their way, then Harald told, uh, told all men to run forward. Then the galley that Harald was on tipped forward and it leapt off the chains with its momentum. Thus Harald got out from Miklagade. The German symphonic metal band Leaf's Eyes released their splendid song Chain of the Golden Horn in 2020. This song is not titled after the actual event or the unfearful protagonist, but after an object, an example of Constantinople's material culture of warfare, the chain. Leaf's Eyes focus on the climax of Harald's escape story that changed the semantics of the change from a limitation of Harald's range of motion to the material testimony of his bravery that makes him a metal hero. The star of the video for the song is neither Harald nor the chain, but one of the few female rulers in Byzantium who has rightly deserved a metal song. The 11th century Empress Zoe Porphyrogenita, a purple-born princess. She is the dark love empress in Leaves Eyes song of that name, in reference of her supposed love affair with Harald Hadrada and other events we talk about in a minute. Her name does actually not appear in the lyrics, so the listener can only discover her identity through the context of the story and through the images in comparison with the visual sources from Byzantium. In this 11th century mosaic in the Hagia Sophia, we see Zoe with her third husband, Emperor Constantine the Ninth Monomachos. She wears a bejeweled crown, a reconstruction of which was specially commissioned for the music video and made by Jan Behm. Constantine's Loros, the imperial garment, was probably an inspiration for Rob Halford's stage outfit of 2015, but this Byzantinism has no connection with any of Judas Priest's songs. Zoe was unmarried until the age of 50, when she was married off to the elderly senator Romanus Ayeros, who became emperor and died six years later in his bath, likely through the hand of Zoe or on her orders. Zoe and her lover Michael celebrated this event by getting married the same day, and Michael was made emperor. But being suspicious of her, he put her out to pasture in the women's quarters until he died seven years later. She was forced to adopt Michael's uh, nephew, also named Michael, who after his enthronement had Zoe exiled. The Constantinopolitans rose against this decision and Zoe and her sister Theodora became joint empresses in 1042. Their collaboration failed, however, and Zoe married a former lover who became Emperor Constantine the Ninth Monomachos, the one in the mosaic. Zoe died eight years later at the age of 72 without having had children. She supposedly had used amulets to try and conceive an heir and even owned an icon of Christ that could magically change color. Her rulership, her lovers, husbands and the use of magic makes her already one of the most amazing Byzantine women. But there was also treachery, adultery, and quite surely murder involved. So she was a real dark love empress. The songs and albums discussed are rewarding for the reception studies of, of the Middle Ages in general, and specifically regarding the capital of the Byzantine Empire, Constantinople. The city is often portrayed from the outsider's view, such as the Crusaders, but more often the Vikings' view. And those songs are diff to different degrees elaborate in their description. In the music by the three bands presented, it is the same story that of Vikings traveling to Constantinople, and particularly Harald and his adventures. The historical background is in all cases well researched, Matthias Nigard from Tourisas, for example, spent considerable time in Istanbul to research the historical background, and Leaves Eyes frontman Alexander Kohl has, has a background in Viking reenactment and much research went into the album The Last Viking. 
It seems, however, that by following the Vikings' trails, the interest of metal for Byzantium is a sort of side effect and not the initial focal point. Heavy metal's lack of interest for Byzantium is remarkable, but also reflected in non-fiction literature and the film industry. There is no What Have the Byzantines Done for Us, no best-selling books and no Hollywood blockbusters as secondary inspiration for, for musicians. This might have to do with Byzantium's reputation as a Christian realm, research on which focuses predominantly on theology, hagiography, and Christian art, such as icons and sacred buildings. This seems to be unattractive for metal, with its preference for male heroes, such as Harald Hadrada, and powerful women involved in sex and crime affairs, as in the case of Empress Zoe. Academic research and the public perception of Byzantium were also influenced by Edward Gibbon's 18th century book, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, for a long period. Gibbon presented a thousand years of late antiquity in Byzantium as a period of decline, and the Middle Ages generally as a dark age, ruled by the church and superstitious beliefs. However, research has brought out many different aspects, such as studies on magic, sorcery and amulets, which were throughout Byzantine history an ongoing problem for the state that consequently tried to eliminate any deviation from the official religion, as is reflected in legislation. We have seen that even the Byzantine ruler Zoe, the dark love empress, was meddling in the dark arts. Heavy metal rather takes inspiration from this counter-narrative, from tales of the untamed, glorious, violent and scandalous, while the hermit who took a vow of silence still patiently awaits a vociferous metal hymn. Thank you for your attention.